House of Ed Tech, Episode 14. Hi, this is Andrea Trevisano from TAC.com. You're listening to the House of Ed Tech with Christopher Nessie. The House of Ed Tech podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash House of Ed Tech. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie. The House of Ed Tech podcast explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing information that you can hear about today and use tomorrow by talking to teachers, leaders, and creators like you and having them share their stories. Because whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. Summer is here. I am on summer vacation, as everybody listening to this should be. If not, I'd, I would love to know where you teach. Let's get right to it. This is going to be a fantastic episode as I'm kicking off my summer PD series. So all the episodes coming up over the summer are going to focus on professional development in some some way. In this episode, I have our usual segments. I have my EdTech thought. I have my EdTech recommendation. And, of course, the House of EdTech VIP. But before I get to this week's featured content... I'd like to talk about some current events, some podcast news, some happenings, as it were. This past week, or this past weekend, uh, we had the 2014 ISTE conference, which was in Atlanta. I got my fill of ISTE 2014 through TeacherCast.net, which is run by my friend Jeff Bradbury. Virtually attending the conference through Jeff's live broadcast was a great learning experience, I was able to participate in the ISTE 2014 hashtag, and I also got in on some of the not at ISTE 14 action, also through Twitter. Participating this way only made me more excited to actually attend the conference next year when ISTE comes to the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. So hopefully you'll all start to save your money and make your plans to have cheesesteaks and technology next year in Philly. I am really, really excited that I'll be able to just basically drive to Philadelphia each day of the conference. It's going to be exciting. In other podcasting news, I would like to thank those of you who have now taken the time to leave feedback in the last two weeks for the podcast. Your reviews are very, very appreciated. It's great to know that you enjoy the podcast and that every review helps more people find the House of Ed Tech. So whether you are a regular listener or this is your first episode, please take a moment and rate and review the podcast in iTunes and also on Stitcher. I also have a little bit of an update. Excuse me. Uh, Tim Charleston, my guest from episode 13, let me know earlier this week that based on our off-air conversations after our interview, that he would be starting his own podcast. As of right now, Tim's soon-to-be-launched podcast is titled The Honest Educator Podcast. I will certainly keep you posted about the status of Tim's podcast, and I will be sure to let you know when he launches it. His most recent blog post provides some more details about his new project, and you can check that out over on his blog, which is at timcharleston.blogspot.com, and I will link to the post in the show notes for this episode. Without any further delay, let's get into this week's very special featured content as I sat down with my wife, the library media specialist, Caitlin Nessie. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to introduce to you this episode's guest and my featured content, a very special person in my life, my wife, Caitlin Nessie. Caitlin is a librarian. She's a high school media specialist. 
She has her bachelor's in communications and also a bachelor's in anthropology, both from William Patterson University here in New Jersey. She also has her master's in library and information science from Drexel University. She is currently the library and media specialist at Shore Regional High School, also here in New Jersey. She has an affinity for technology and education. She also has a bit of an affinity for me because she's my wife, and she's also the mother of our wonderful son, Miles. So for the first time, and I'm sure it won't be the last, I'd like to introduce everybody to Kate Nessie. How you doing, dear? I'm doing well. How about yourself? (laughs) Well, I'm doing very well. We're in the same house. Of course you know I'm doing well. You forgot to add that I'm certified through Rutgers for my media specialist certificate. I did. Well, you just told everybody yeah. that. So there so thank you, you for – folks, once again, that proves that behind every man is a good woman who backs him up. There you go. So, dear, the whole reason I wanted to have you on the House of EdTech is because you love technology as much as I do, and you also work in education, and I think that you have a lot to offer – and a lot to share with the audience. So are you ready? I think so. Cool. Now, obviously, I know enough about you that I could do the Kate Nessie fan podcast. So I know the answers to much of these questions, but I want you to share who you are with everybody else. So with that being said, what inspired you to become a librarian? Well, after uh, getting my undergrad degree, I worked in television and uh, publishing for a little while, but just felt like there was something more for me to do. And I wanted to go back to get a master's degree, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go the anthropology route all the way to a PhD or see what else was out there. So during in between jobs, I had subbed for an elementary school, a couple elementary schools actually, and I ended up in the school library a couple times. And every time I was in the library subbing for the librarian, I thought it was so much fun. And I just really love the kids and just being around information and, you know, teaching and all of that. But I knew being like a full-time teacher wasn't for me. So I decided to, you know, continue working. I went and found a job working for a community college. So I thought, well, maybe I would like working in a an academic library setting. So I looked into what you had to do to become a librarian. And I was surprised to find that you actually have to have a master's. If you want to work in a, you know, public library or an academic library, and even a lot of school libraries now require the master's or the media special certificate at the very least. So I decided to look in the programs and I ended up going with Drexel because I was working full time at the time. So I was able to do my degree online and participate that way without having to travel and, and do all the night classes and things. Um, I did the the degree within a year. I kind of really pushed myself, took a lot of courses, just got it done. And I was real heavy on research and writing and all that kind of stuff, which I thrived on, which is why, you know, I did the anthropology degree when I was younger. And um, so I just found that to be something I really loved. And going into it, I thought, well, maybe I'll end up, you know, in in a college or a research library, something along those lines. And while I was working, I had come across an opportunity to work in a public library. So I went for the county library job, and I ended up working with young adults, which, I'll be honest, I thought I would absolutely hate. I thought I would go to work, work with teenagers, and they'd drive me nuts, and I'd be exhausted and want to go home and just thought it wasn't for me. And lo and behold, I worked with them for two years, and I just loved it. I had a great time. I really enjoyed it. But when you work with teens in the public library, unfortunately, you only have to work nights and weekends because the teens are in school all day. So if I wanted to kind of keep it that demographic, I kind of had to look outside and see what else there was in order to not have to work just nights and weekends. So I continued on. I interviewed for a lot of school jobs. A lot of times it was elementary or middle school, but I just didn't feel it was a good fit for me. So I ended up taking another position as an integrated technology librarian and thought that'd be a great way for me to not only have the experience working with the young adults, but kind of get my feet wet working in technology and library systems and find a way to kind of put that all together to maybe pave the way to going into working in a high school library or an academic library setting. So through that, I did that for another year and that was a lot of fun. And I'm still friends with my supervisor to this day because we just, you know, we worked so well together. And then I ended up uh, going into the school libraries 
and I went into, started out in a K to three school just to kind of give it a shot. And, you know, it was a lot of fun, very exhausting. The little ones are cute, but definitely not tech oriented the way that I was hoping to work with them. And uh, so I knew I wanted to work with a little bit older students. So through a budget cut, I ended up snagging another job in a high school that was phenomenal. And then unfortunately, at the end of that year, another budget cut. And so I moved on to another school and stayed there for about four years, which was great. And I really was able to kind of build my skills and library management, running, you know, a, a high school library. And now I'm starting a tour regional in the fall. So I'm really excited to be a part of a school that has Google Apps for Education and kind of going into that technology realm even more so and kind of being somebody in the school that people can look to for help. So I just kind of fell into it here and there, kind of went different ways and found that I love doing what I do. And now I'm really thankful that, you know, I get to go to work every day and work with people that I like, doing things that I like. And basically my whole focus is to help people as much as I can. I'm there to help in whatever way that I can do. And and the amazing thing about you, Caitlin, is that not only do you do all those things for your jobs and for the kids, but you also do all that stuff for me and support me the same way you would support anybody. So she's being very genuine in her desire. And when she states she's a supportive person. So you're a librarian, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we established that. Yes. What is so attractive about technology and education to you uh, from the librarian's perspective? Well, as a librarian, I have a little bit more time to really work with things and kind of muddle through and, and try out and test out and kind of see what's out there. So I can kind of help curate stuff for teachers that don't necessarily have the time to go out and do all of these kind of things, um, you know, who might be overwhelmed with grades or testing or all the things that are coming down the pike. So I feel like being a technology guru and, and understanding all of that and, and seeking all that information out, I can kind of build up my toolbox so that when somebody comes to me and says, you know, I'm having this problem or I'm thinking about this or I'm trying to figure that out, I can say, hey, here's, you know, here's an idea, here's another idea, here's something to try, and then be that person to kind of help them through it, not just give it to them and walk away, but actually be somebody to go back and forth with and, and collaborate on. So I like a lot of that being in the library and in the school, just, you know, being a tech leader, but not only that, but kind of bringing people along with me, kind of working with them, not just, at, you know, talking at them, but talking with them. If you could share with everybody in as much detail or as briefly as you want, what are some ways that you have utilized technology and made those recommendations with faculty, students, and the administrations you've worked with? Oh, sure. A lot of times, um, you know, whether years ago when social media was just starting working in the one high school library, you know, we started to kind of integrate, you know, Twitter and, and different things to get messages out to students or get them involved or using websites like Delicious and having tag clouds and helping students figure out how to navigate this new technology landscape and bringing in different technologies. You know, current stuff now, um, in my previous school, they didn't use Google Apps for Education, but I brought that into a lot of classes just kind of uh, organically, you know, working one teacher to, you know, to another teacher or things like that. I'd work with them in Google Drive or, or writing, you know, creating their research papers, stuff like that. So I kind of would try and bring in bits and pieces. I also did a lot of workshops. You know, I would learn about a technology and then I'd go to my administration and say, Hey, this is something really cool. Do I, you know, is there time to fit me in at the next professional development day or, you know, and I would, you know, have an hour that way. So I taught, you know, teachers how to maybe bring in guest speakers through Skype or how to use Schoology or Edmodo with their classes. There was other times where I just did it on my own. I, I created in my previous school what I would do was called something called lunch and learn sessions. I would have sign-ups for the teachers to come, and they would, instead of going to sit in the faculty room and eat their lunch like they do every day, I'd invite them to bring their lunch to the library, and in that lunchtime period, they can kind of learn a new technology or a new way to do something to make their lives a little bit easier or to introduce something new. Um, say Prezi was one of the lunch and learns I've done before, or how to, teachers, how to set, uh, get teachers interested to use Twitter for a, a PLN. I would do things like that where I would just say, hey, you know, bring your lunch, sign up, 
they would get, you know, hours or credits for it. I would submit the, the sign in to the administration. And the teachers loved it because it was a way for them not only to, you know, learn something new in that time period, but it didn't interrupt all the other time that they had throughout the day that, that took a lot of work. And it wasn't, you know, too overwhelming that they were, you know, walked out kind of shell-shocked. They had some time to digest it. We could talk about it. And then they'd usually come back to me, you know, another day or two. We'd talk more about how to get it going with their class. Now, I've been a big proponent and a huge fan of your Lunch and Learns since you came up with the idea. So I, I think that's one of the really cool things that you've done with faculty. What are some of the ways that you've connected with students that you've worked with and supported them? I usually know, you know, what they're working on or have an idea of papers, whether or not I've taught them, you know, database information or research or, you know, some teachers would ask me to teach them how to use, you know, Google Docs or Prezi to, to write their papers. So a lot of times working with students, they'd come in and say, hey, you know, I I'm, want to do this or I'm doing that. And I'd work with them and, you know, help them along those lines. Other ways, though, I have students that come in who may or may not have technology at home. You know, there's that whole digital divide that, that librarians pay a lot of attention to, making sure that we, you know, can get equal access for everybody. And a lot of times I'll talk with students and find out kind of a little bit more what what they're dealing with, whether it's at home or, or issues technology-wise. And I'll suggest things to them like open office, you know, setting them up with a Google Apps account so that they can work, you know, at home and they don't need to have paid for software to get their work done. I've had students where, you know, they need to edit a photo or do presentations or things of that nature. You know, I'll take them right to the website Pixlr and they can upload a photo, and they can edit it and tweak it and do whatever they need to do for their presentation. So everything's kind of out in the cloud. And, you know, so a lot of those kind of things, I'll work with students to introduce them to it, and then maybe they'll tell a friend or, you know, if they haven't had a teacher that, that's brought them down to the library to show them that kind of stuff. So I kind of will, will work that in as they bring me their issues and concerns or what they're struggling with. I give them some different directions and different ways to work with it. That's my wife. Not only does she like to eat organic, but she also spreads knowledge and information organically, which is really cool. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I've had a couple, as, as you, you know, as the number one fan of the House of EdTech, I've, I've spoken to principals like Jessica Johnson and Teresa Steger, and they as principals talk about how they support their staff with technology. As a library media specialist, you're in a unique position where you've also supported administration differently than I as a teacher, other teachers I could talk to have done that. What are some ways that you've supported and given this wealth of knowledge and information to admin? Uh, well, as a librarian, oftentimes I do find myself very much sandwiched in that space between teachers and administration. Sometimes I'm the go-between person, um, you know, if, if there's concerns or teachers are having technology problems and, you know, admin's not getting what they need. So I kind of help, you know, bridge the gap, so to say. But other ways I've helped the administration at various times, you know, I've had, you know, I kind of just listen to what's going on in the school and try and offer what I can help. And one year, the first year I was at uh, my previous school, you know, they were having such struggles getting, you know, computer labs sign up, set up. And, you know, it was on paper and it was a calendar on the door and somebody might erase somebody's name because they needed it. And, you know, just a lot of chaos surrounding that. So I came up with something for the library that I used so teachers didn't have to come up to the library to sign up for a period. You know, they could do it right online from their classroom and then just come that time or day and see what was available. And I set it up something called You Can Book Me. So it's youcanbook.me. And I would set that up with a Google Calendar and basically the teachers can see that. I had set that up for the library, and then I was hearing about these other three computer labs and, you know, computer on wheel carts and all that, you know, people trying to figure out scheduling. And I said, hey, you know, do you want me to set this up for all of these other places in the building? And it kind of runs itself each semester. We just have to update the schedule. So, you know, I threw that out there, and they said, sure, let's go with it. And from there, you know, it became the new thing. And, and basically, you know, teachers were – appreciative and people could update and see and they never had to really leave their room to go check another room or walk around the building to figure out which lab was going to be open their period. Saved them a lot of time, but it also saved the administration, you know, huge headache of complaints or, you know, issues and everything else. And it just ran a lot smoother. 
so, you know, and as we added more computer carts or, or labs or whatever, we just, you know, threw in new calendars, and it worked pretty smoothly that way. So a lot of times I just kind of have my eyes and ears open as to what's, what's kind of happening. And, and as people are talking, I'm kind of racking my brain for, hmm, how can we do this more efficiently? How can we make it better to help everybody in a situation so that, you know, there isn't the chaos and and confusion or issues between staff members or, you know, all that kind of stuff that's going on. I understand 100% because if there's anything we need less of in schools, it's confusion and uh, people being unsure of what's going on in their buildings. You are about to begin your first year in a new school, Shore Regional High School. Folks, I am more than ecstatic for this opportunity for Caitlin because she she is passionate about technology. I'll tell you flat out, she's going to have a real great opportunity to spread her wings with what she knows and what she'll be able to offer them. And they, in turn, have also presented themselves as a forward-thinking school and a district. Caitlin, what are you looking forward to most and what are you excited about in this new position? Um, I'm really excited to learn even more. I want to see how uh, Google Apps for Ed is being used. The school also has Chromebooks uh, one-to-one for every student. So I'm kind of really excited to be in that environment where everybody has technology. And not only do we go forward with using new technologies, but knowing that no student is going to be left out in the process. And I'm excited just to kind of explore all the, you know, new staff members I'm going to work with, new students, new culture. Um, the administration seems super supportive of technology and ideas. So really just, you know, kind of taking all of my stuff to the next level and seeing what more I can help with and what, what more I can do and, and seeing how I can grow. Google Classroom we're, we're getting started with in the fall, and I've been working with them a lot, um, you know, just in the last month to get things set up for the library. And, you know, these are all new things. They're, they're not being done in, in too many other schools or, or other places. There's a lot of tools and things that are being used in education that weren't initially designed for education. So, you know, it's a lot of, you know, trial and error and figuring out what works and working with companies and vendors and getting them to understand how education works and what we need and kind of making it all come together. You know, I've been using Google Drive when it was Google Docs when it, you know, first came out and all it was was, you know, kind of like a word pad online and, oh, my gosh, it's saved. And it was out somewhere in the world. You know, so seeing how far that's come to now where you can turn in assignments and grade and comment and do all of these kind of things, you know, gearing towards education, I'm excited to kind of see where that all kind of comes together. And I'm excited to talk about it with you all the time, even more. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, my wife and I, we, we have a lot of fun with each other, obviously, because we're married and we have common interests. And from time to time, we do like to play games. So, Caitlin, we're going to play a little game here on the House of Ed Tech that I've introduced in the last couple of episodes that I'm borrowing from the Principal Cast podcast, and it's a game of word association. I'm not going to treat you any differently. I'm going to give you either a word or words, and just tell me the first word that comes to your mind about the, the term that I say. Do you got the rules? I do. Okay, here we go. Online learning. Oh, gosh. A variety of formats, I guess you could say. That's a whole lot of words for a one-word answer, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at rules. All right, I don't that, listen. <laughs> that's a, well, as, as you know, neither do I. <laughs> uh, well, let's On to the next one. Uh, digital citizenship. Essential. Did I, did I get the rules right this time? Yes. I, I, <laughs> good job, dear. <laughs> okay. Here's something more up your alley. Card catalog. Old. Nice. <laughs> Google. New. <laughs> er. New er. <laughs> Next one. B Y O D. Well, first thing that came to mind was bring your own device, but uh, awesome. Cool. Makerspace. Uh, super, 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 super awesome. All one word. Yes. <laughs> Hashtag. Hashtag. Super okay. awesome. <laughs> Perfect. And the last one, this might be the toughest one. Chris Nessie. Funny. You always make me laugh. I certainly do try every day to put a smile on your face. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Well, that's it, because I think we have to go to bed now. <laughs> um, 
Yes, because it's my birthday tomorrow. That's right. My, Caitlin, when is your birthday? My birthday is July 4th, and we are recording on July 3rd, even though this is not going to come out till July 6th. Very good. Happy birthday to from me to you publicly through to the whole world, my July 4th firecracker baby. Although you're not my baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm not your baby. <laughs> That's just weird. <laughs> but but you should... <laughs> go ahead. I have to say this is the first podcast I've ever done, and I do feel somewhat like it was a job interview, but I think I did well. <laughs> I think you did smashing, and obviously uh, there is room for you to come on any time that you want because, well, I know where to find you. Well, you know, I'm I'm always available to talk about organics. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so for people who want to connect with you, what are the best ways that you'll let them do that? How, how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Um, you can check out my blog. It's uh, blog, B-L-O-G, period, Kate Nessie, K-A-T-E-N-E-S-I dot com. Uh, I write about life, food, fitness, and photos. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of a mishmash of all sorts of fun things. Uh, I might be writing more about libraries and technology and ed tech in the coming year. And then I am also on Twitter. So I am at Kate Nessie. So K-A-T-E-N-E-S-I. And I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's Kate underscore Nessie. And everything else, everywhere else online, I'm pretty much the same. Kate Nessie. So... You probably can find me on most sites like Pinterest or uh, I have a Facebook page and everything else. So you can check me out that way. Or if you want to send me an email, you can always email me at kate at katenessie.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I love you dearly and thank you for all your support. And really, as I mentioned a couple episodes ago, you are one of the big reasons that the House of Ed Tech even exists. So Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I enjoy it, and I'm glad to see that you're doing well and meeting a lot of new people, and I look forward to meeting more people. I've met some really great people that you've already interviewed for the podcast when we've gone to uh, different ed tech conferences, so it's pretty cool to kind of put faces behind names and reach out to other people and get information. So you know, I hope if anybody needs information or help or ideas, definitely contact me, and I'm I'm all for it. That's what I'm here to do, help people. She's a librarian through and through, folks. All right, dear, we will talk to you soon. All right, talk to you later. For this week's EdTech Thought, I'd like to talk a little bit about some Twitter chats that you should be aware of. And this totally fits in with my summer PD theme, as Twitter is proving to be a very, very valuable tool for educators all over the world who want to get informal professional development. Now, professional development is so valuable in and of itself because it allows us as educators, whether we're teachers or administrators, to learn. And I know that sounds really basic, but that's what it is. It's continued learning. And it is so valuable, especially as teachers. Twitter adds a lot of value to our professional development as educators. So I'd like to share with you some Twitter chats that you should be aware of. Some of these you may know, some you may not know. So here we go. Number one is Ed Tech Chat. Ed Tech Chat takes place on Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And I'll just go ahead and say that all the times that I will say are all Eastern time. So East Coast rules. No offense to the West Coast. Number two is flip class. And that's also on Monday nights at 8 p.m. So if you are somebody who currently flips your classroom or you're thinking about dabbling in flipping your classroom, this would be a great Twitter chat to get in on. Number three is everybody's well-known ed chat, which is on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. And there is also a noontime one during the school year that also takes place. Uh, personally, I don't understand the 12 noon ed chat because most teachers at 12 noon, even on Eastern time, are in school. So to me, that, that one's a little tough to participate in. Number four, special ed chat, which is SPED chat, S-P-E-D chat. 
and that's on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Number five, STEM chat. For all the science, technology, engineering, and math teachers out there, STEM chat takes place on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Another great chat is GT chat, which is gifted and talented chat, which is Fridays at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then on Saturday mornings, the very popular and world-renowned Sat Chat takes place again Saturday mornings at 7.30 a.m. And they also run another chat later in the morning for the Pacific Coasters, which is Sat Chat West Coast, or Sat Chat WC, which would be at 7.30 Pacific time. And the last Twitter chat that I'd like to recommend that you check out is 21 Ed Chat, which is all about education here in the 21st century. And that takes place on Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Now, obviously, there are also so many more chats that are available on Twitter every day and at various times. And there are also a variety of state-based chats. For example, NJ Ed, which is currently on hiatus for the summer, but that normally runs on Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern Time. For a thorough listing of educational hashtags, I definitely recommend you check out one of Cyberary Man Jerry Blumengarten's pages, and he has a hashtag page at cybraryman.com slash edhashtags.html, and there will be a link to this page in the show notes, and there are quite a few educational-based hashtags listed on Jerry's Cyberary Man page, so definitely check that out. And that's my EdTech thought. And now let's get into this episode's EdTech recommendation. Let's go out to the movies. Let's go out to the movies. Oh, you don't like that song? Oh, well, it's my show. I do what I want. Earlier this week, I spotted a great headline, which was titled, The 55 Essential Movies Kids Must Experience Before They Turn 13. And this was on Entertainment Weekly's website, which is EW.com. Now, I know you might be thinking, Mr. Nessie, how on earth did you find something on Entertainment Weekly that could be relevant for the podcast? Well, let me tell you, this article contains a legitimate 55 awesome movies, and there are actually some I've never seen. But summer is a great time to reconnect with your own children, or let's say you don't have kids, you can go back in time to your own childhood or when you were younger. So here is a sampling of some of the movies on the list. And this is in actually a specific order that I'm just going to take from EW.com. The first is 1979's The Muppet Movie. I know, I know. Maybe you're not a fan of The Muppets, but your kids would love it. So perhaps you want to go back and revisit The Muppet Movie. Number two, 1995's Toy Story, starring Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. If you've never seen Toy Story, where have you been for the last almost 20 years? Go see Toy Story. It's fantastic, and it never gets old. Number three, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Not the Jim Carrey version, the classic 1966 animated feature starring Boris Karloff. So go check that out, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which is also great for the whole Christmas in July thing. Number four, and I'll be honest, this is one I've never actually seen, uh, 1995's Babe. Not the John Goodman Babe Ruth movie, but the movie about the pig. Um, What I do know is that Babe contains a great moral lesson hidden under the distractions of adorable talking farm animals. So you really can't go wrong there. Number five, 1964's Mary Poppins, starring Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke. Classic. I love Mary Poppins and I love the music. Number six, Beauty and the Beast from 1991. Fantastic, fantastic Disney movie. Number seven, 1989's The Little Mermaid. A lot of Disney on this uh, on this list, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, number eight, 
Finding Nemo from 2003, starring Albert Brooks, Ellen DeGeneres, and Alexander Gould. This is a great movie, and I'm actually looking forward to the upcoming sequel, Finding Dory. Ellen's going to do a fantastic job with that. Number nine brings us to uh, the oldest film that I'm going to share with you, 1956's The Red Balloon. Pixar is all over this list, so instead of up, look back to this delectable near-silent French short film, which clearly inspired the image of a man being carried away by a rainbow bouquet of balloons. That's all I'm going to share with you about The Red Balloon, but you're going to definitely want to check out number nine on this list. And the last one that I'll share with you before I send you off to the article itself, uh, number 10, 1940s, Pinocchio from Disney. Not only is Pinocchio the perfect vehicle to teach a child the importance of telling the truth, it's an important film that cracks open the darker corners of our imaginations as well. I will post a link to the full article in this episode's show notes. The article is really cool because it has descriptions and some insight about the films, and it also has trailers or snippets from each film that might get you excited and inspire you to Netflix it or Redbox it, or maybe you have it in your own collection and you can take it out and uh, throw it in the player this summer and, uh, and escape with your imagination. If you have a great program or a tool that more people should know about, please share it with me. I know I didn't share a traditional piece of software in this particular recommendation, but I'm also a fan of movies, so I thought I would try something a little different. But again, if you have something, a tool, a resource, a website, uh, send it over to me, and I can help spread the word. You can tweet me. My username is Mr. Nessie, or you can also email the show, and the address is feedback at chrisnessie.com. Now it's time for the highly outrageous and highly contagious House of Ed Tech VIP. This episode's VIP is Mr. Jason Bodner. Jason is a middle school assistant principal. He has a bachelor's in biology and a chemistry minor from Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne. He also has his master's in educational leadership and administration from Ball State University. Mr. Bodner has previously worked as a high school science teacher and he just completed his first year at Lane Middle School as a vice principal. He is an active presenter and has presented sessions which include, and these are titles, Going Beyond the Status Quo with Unique Electives and Extracurricular Clubs, Digital Tools for Telling Your School's Story, iPad Creation Tools for Students, Building a Strong Professional Learning Network through Twitter, and Providing Student Voice through Websites and or Podcasting. And it's actually really ironic that he's done something on podcasting because Jason recently launched a podcast of his own. His podcast is called The Principally Speaking Podcast, and it's a podcast devoted to helping new administrators with the transition from the classroom to the principalship. You can check out his podcast at principallyspeaking.com, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L-L-Y, speaking.com. For more information, check out his website and his other educational resources. Subscribe to his podcast today and tell him Mr. Nessie sent you. And you can also connect with Jason via Twitter. His username is Mr. Jason Bodner, M-R-J-A-S-O-N-B-O-D-N-A-R. And again, his website is principallyspeaking.com. I've had the opportunity to talk to Jason, and I wish him nothing but great success with his podcast. And so he's only a couple episodes in, and it's a great opportunity to check out a new podcast and expand your horizons that way. And congratulations to Jason, this episode's House of EdTech VIP. Well, it's that time. And it's going to do it for this episode of the House of Ed Tech. I am Christopher Nessie. Please keep the conversation going and visit my website, mr.chrisnessie.com. You can check out the show notes for this episode at mr.chrisnessie.com 
slash 2014 slash 07 slash House of Ed Tech 14 dot HTML. If you have questions or comments, I would love your feedback. You can leave a comment on the show notes for this episode. You can also click the SpeakPipe button on my website, or you can call the House of Ed Tech hotline, the number 732 903 4869. You can also email the show, feedback at chrisnessy.com, or send me a tweet. I'm Mr. Nessie on Twitter, M R N E S I, and just use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. I also welcome you to connect with me on Voxer. My username is CNessy4602. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Your five star rating and positive review will help keep the House of Ed Tech front and center for others to discover and enjoy. Be sure to come back to the House for the next episode, which is scheduled to be released on July 20th, 2014, when I continue my summertime fun PD series. Thank you for listening, and remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. Thank you.